The Living Museum is a space in society where people with mental illness come and they change their identity from a crazy person to a crazy artist. Well, the Living Museum is part of Creedmoor Psychiatric Center, and uh, Creedmoor is the, the largest state hospital in New York, and it's part of the hospital. It's a state-owned, state-operated hospital, and uh, we are part of the rehab department, as if. And we started it uh, over 30 years ago. By my, I was able to convince the director then to hire a friend of mine, an artist, and just let him be an artist, not a therapist, not a counselor, but just an artist. And we took over the building and uh, the Living Museum happened within two weeks. We filled it up with artwork and then we fixed it up over the years. And now we have the largest collection of artwork by people with mental illness. You know, it was never really um, conceived as such, but by Fiat, it happened that it is run by the patients. There's only one staff there, it's me. And there are over 100 people who come there regularly by Fiat. It's a bunch of artists, actually. You know, that's what it is. And uh, the therapy, there's no therapy. And I, I'm not a big believer in therapy for mentally ill people anyway. So uh, the therapy happens in another part of the hospital. You know, everybody who comes there, uh, they have their own therapists, and then, uh, they have their own psychiatrists, they are, all of them are on medication. So by the time I receive them in my building, we don't worry about mental illness, we don't worry about any of those things.
Martin's first institutions of war, Dr. Martin and Kathy, um, outside on, on, at the tables. Um, and I had, had these locks. And then one day I came, I came in because I was like real uh, tired and stuff from that lifestyle. And then, the, like, a couple of days later, I told them my story. Actually, what happened, how I got, how I know about the facility. And then I told them my story. And then one day I came back. So before we get into the words, I would like everybody to know that Michelangelo is back. And he's been with that one. It should have been a sculpture with marble. I really can't afford right now. I built sculptures with coat hangers. And I did stuff. I moved into my co-op a week before 9-11. Yeah, and I went to throw garbage on the chute. They have a chute to put the garbage down.
God created the world. He didn't want to be alone, so he created man. And man, cre man created woman, no. And then women came upon the earth. Um, the name of the Living Museum uh, came from uh, two sources. One uh, was Julian Beck and his wife Messina, who were uh, famous as uh, the Living Theater. Bolek came from the theater himself, and he was good friends with Ju Julian Beck. The idea there was to make professional theater and bring the professional theater to places uh, where it's unusual, supermarkets. They were involved in the anti-war movement at the time, but they moved away from the proscenium scene in the theater and brought it to other places. So the idea uh, Bolek and I had to bring modern art to a, a hospital. That's how it started. This living museum is to be thought as as a visionary utopian space for people who then create in this space and in their freedom beautiful art. A long time ago that what stands out is that my hair was different. I had the same type of style and it was it was locks when I was first introduced to um, Dr. Martin and Kathy um, outside on, on at the tables. Um, and I had had these locks, and then one day I came, I came in because I was like real uh, tired and stuff from that lifestyle. And then, the, like a couple of days later, I told them my story. Actually, what happened, what happened, how I got, how I know about the facility, and then I told them my story. Then one day I came back, and I was bald. <laughs> I then shaved off, I then shaved off all my hair. And they was like, what happened? What did you do? I was like, uh, I just wanted to give change. And then that's when I got started on the journey of um, really accepting who I am. And a different life, a different lifestyle was about to begin for me. So I gave myself a shot. And, um, before we get any further, I would like everybody to know that Michelangelo is back. And he's better than ever. Uh, Instead of building sculptures with marble, I really can't afford right now, I built sculptures with coat hangers. And I did some, hundreds of them. How I started with the coat hangers is, I moved into my co-op a week before 9-11. And I went to drill garbage down the chute, now they got the chute in the apartment building, and somebody had a sack of hangers for recycle. I said, I'm gonna make something with these hangers. So I laid a little bird about this big, he's flying to my house, my vomit. And I just blossomed from there. I built anything with hangers. I built oh, everything. A self portrait of me I built, and yeah. In a house of chips, everyone has red. anthropologically extended definition of art. And the idea was that it is not what's in the frame, but what emanates from the frame. What, uh, what causes in the audience, in the spectator, uh, as an energetic thing. And, and if you have it in, in a group setting like ours, you create a social sculpture, a social work. So that creates the community here. And this is actually the most, uh, they call it ephemeral, you know, it disappears. It's like in the air, it's not quite clear what it is. But uh, I mean, you have the vibrations, it's an energetic idea. And uh, uh, so if you move into the living, if you come into the living museum, you, you feel it. The first time I came in, I was blown away by the space. And I think that's the effect it has on most people that it's a very grand space. There's an incredible 
amount of artwork everywhere you can look. And there are people, there are a lot of people working on their, their art, their individual pieces. And I felt that this was a space that was created specifically as a safe kind of oasis for artists to be able to express themselves. And I was captivated by that. I uh, came to the Living Museum after reading a book called, Is There No Place on Earth for Me? And uh, that was um, written by a former patient. And she mentioned it. it. It wasn't about the Living Museum, but she mentioned the space. And she, meant, she spoke of it fondly. And uh, just, it meant a lot to her. She, she got, you know, it was a place of safety for her. And she mentioned it with great uh, reverence. And so I said, I, I'd like to see that place. So I finally had time. And I came and I talked to Doc and ended up uh, really enjoying the place. You know, during my psychiatry rotation in medical school, I've always been interested in uh, um, psychiatry and mental illness. And so I learned a lot here regarding that. It's a very unique place where um, everybody with all cerebral differences are welcome. And uh, you can learn a lot from each other. It looks like a, like a haunted mansion or something. And, and it's like got candles and lots of um, art and lots of things to and, and plenty of things I don't think could fit, fit more than one thing in here. I've always been an artist, you know, I always started as a child and um, I, I did lots of um, artwork in my schools and stuff and, and my art can keep on getting better and better, you know. Oh my God. If, still, if the first time I walked in here, just even, even some of the work was premature or elementary or even some was very sophisticated. There was something about it, you know, seeing all these people and though I, I, I never made friends, I never talked to people, I tried to, but they walk away and they don't want to listen. I don't know why, but um, I mean, it's some place, it was some place where Bolek and you, Dr. Martin, um, took me in you know, I felt as men, you know, as mentors to me, and at the time, basically, um, Bolick because he said, Paula, just if you get a piece of wood outside, paint on it. If you if you have a wall, a blank wall, paint on it. If you have something, don't worry, just put your thoughts down. And I took that into consideration. I took that into um, a compliment, um, a love. in this ahistoric uh, spiritual place ultimately. That's the same place where people hear voices, where people live in a completely different environment in their heads. And that's where the 
uh, great art happens. That's why you can enjoy art from the Middle Ages just as, as you can enjoy it modern art. You know, it's, it's, uh, it happens in that domain where the angels fly. You know. And the people with mental illness have two things that uh, uh, is very important when it comes to creation of art. One of, the, uh, one of it is more of a pedestrian way of, of seeing things, that they have incredible amount of uh, time on their hands. You know, that is also usually the problem uh, for people with mental illness. That you have to fill the time up, you watch television, you sit around, you don't know what to do with yourself. So you know, once you are becoming an artist, time is exactly what you need. The Bliven Museum is a great place for structure for people who like to do artwork. It's a great structured place for artwork. It's a great entity and matter for people like myself. I have a lot of serious trauma still after X amount of years of sobriety and doing quite well. And I come here to the Living Museum just as, just as who I am and focus on my work, my, my business, and, and, and it, it, it fills me up. It fills me up. It structures my time, it structures my day. Doing artwork at the Living Museum, for real, no bullshit, I'm going to say it like that, it defeats a lot of serious trauma that I suffer from and um, helps me to straighten myself out and move forward with my, with my matters and everything and let go of the past. It's very, very important, the Living Museum. And, and they have the total freedom here to express what they want, to use any material what they want, and... Um, to be really themselves completely. There's no therapy. The word therapy is not liked here because we think that what we do, who work with these people, we are their friends. We are giving them nothing else than kindness. Kindness is probably the most important virtue that's being experienced here. And people who come in, they, they sense a different energy. This is a place we call utopian space because it, is, it has no jealousy, it has no envy, the artists are helpful to each other. If someone comes in and asks for advice, advice is given, help is given, individual needs are met and um, we think of it as a model that should eventually become a model for society at large. Yeah, creativity and mental illness go together. And this is something that uh, it is not known uh, to most people, even people who work on the, in the field of creativity. There is one guy who wrote a major book called In the Floor, you know, Chick Sent Me High, a Chicago-based uh, psychologist who died recently. Um, and uh, he says that he was analyzing people who became famous as artists or became famous as scientists. They all have one quality that they can focus and they can go with the flow. And uh, this is my experience with people who come here. They are able to do that. And again, I, I think it is connected to the illness. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's something relatively new for me. Uh, I get an image in my mind and I want to put it out before I, my mind alters it and then read it, you know, instead of like most artists have a message in their work, I'm reading and seeing what my subconscious is trying to tell me. And uh, so I'm kind of doing art therapy on myself and uh, it's kind of like, you know, I want to go eye to eye with my madness. I want to grab it by the scruff of the collar and throw it up against the wall, you know. <laughs> Oh, doctor, doctor, I'm crazy, you know, <laughs> the whole thing. But it, it's good for me, you know. An artist, we 
that they create some, that artists create some phenomenal things that that's never heard of, never imagined that, and is always waiting and anxious to see what an artist have done and created today. It's, it's amazing. The height of artistic expression here is mainly because they stay so long. They have such a focus on what, uh, what they do and such an investment, a uh, passionate investment in their works that, that now you have here works that you are really finding better than things that the visit in the Museum of Modern Art because you are touched in a different space. I, was, I did this painting of space and I just painted this uh, piece of really large piece of paper, I painted it black and I used a paintbrush with white paint and I kind of flicked it and it made like a little spray on the, on the paper and it looked like stars. Actually, Issa Ibrahim helped me with that. That was like my first art piece I had, I had ever done here and he was uh, a part of that. I think what I appreciated about the Living Museum is um, how free it is and also, how um, simple, in a way, the, the recipe is. You have space, you have freedom, you have materials. And I remember when Janos said that uh, if you have freedom, then you, it's like you don't need restrictions if you have the right kind of freedom. And so seeing that this was a free place where people could come and create, uh, it's very simple, but it's also weirdly re revolutionary because it's hard to find a space like this. That's what we are doing here, that we create a space where you, you have your materials, you have your spot, you have a comfortable place, you have a stress-free environment, and, and, and people start creating very, very interesting things. You know, everybody. I, would, I mean, again, Joseph Weiss says everybody is an artist. And when, once you recognize it, then what you recognize is that you, they, they need the environment in which they can create. Let's go. 